In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to be talking about fires under tarps, more bushcraft on television, getting pumped forearms when making feather sticks, at the time to harvest wood for carving, and Tifa fiber extraction. Welcome, welcome to episode 65 of Ask Paul Kirtley with me, Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions on wilderness bushcraft, survival skills and outdoor life. And I found this nice little nook at the base of this tree here to sit and it's, there's not much breeze today, but here it feels quite sheltered. There's just quite a slight cold breeze and it's, it's quite cozy down here. I've got the, the uh, back mat out of my day pack, just a foam mat that sits in between you and the contents of your pack normally. Um, that's pulled out, I put it on the ground so I can sit on it. So I've got some insulation under my backside. I've got my uh, hot coffee here. I've put a duvet jacket on so I stay warm after walking. And I am good to go. I am good to go with a few more questions that have been sent in to ask Paul Kirtley. First question is from Mike. And his question is about fires under tarps. He says, hi, Paul. I read something recently that talked about fires under tarps being okay if the tarp is set up correctly. I assume that there is a bit more to it than that type of wood and tarp material, maybe. I have a DD Superlight, which feels like it might burst into flames at the mere mention of a fire. Any wisdom? Much appreciated. Well... Michael, I'm going to put my glove back on because it's quite chilly. The problem with smartphones is touchscreens don't work very well when you've got gloves on. Um, something that catches people out in the mountains when they're trying to use them for navigating in bad weather. But and there have been a lot. There's been a lot of cases of people getting caught out in bad weather in the mountains in the UK recently. Unfortunately, um, in the winter conditions or the changeable conditions we've had, that have often turned into serious winter conditions. Um, so thoughts and prayers out to people who have lost uh, loved ones. It's, there's been some tragedies recently, unfortunately. Um, but yes, fires under tarps are nice things to do in the woods, particularly at this time of year. You can get a nice warm recirculation of air going with not a huge big fire. And I think that's part of it. I think you think about the size of fire you might need to cook on or to stay warm out in the open. And then you extrapolate to having that underneath the fire and you think, well, that's going to damage my tarp. You can actually get away with quite a small fire because a lot of that warm air that would be lost out into the atmosphere Sphere, um, into the wider world is going to get bounced back and recirculated round under your tarp. So that's part of it. Part of it is right sizing the fire. I think the biggest danger is, as you probably know, Mike, um, when you light your fire and you're using a lot of kindling, you're going to get quite high flame potentially. Even if it's raining outside, and you'd light your fire and you'd need plenty of kindling and you need to have enough energy in that initial stage of your fire to drive off the moisture so that you can light the next stage. If you're under a tarp, you've got protection from the rain. And that's another good reason to have a tarp even in your day pack, because if you stop, um, whether it's intentional or unintentional, you can put a temporary shelter up and be out of the rain. Even if it's just, you know, today, if it was raining, I could put a tarp up here where I am. There's a branch that comes down from that tree over there that's stiff enough. I could tie a tarp, one end of the tarp to it. I could tie the other end to this tree that I'm sat under and I'd have to have it pretty close to this end just to make sure there was no water dripping down that end. I'd have it angled slightly that way so any water landing on it, but it would be would be running off that way away from me, not towards me. But then I would have my camera that sat in front of me here and my gear all in the dry and I would mostly, uh, if not entirely, be in the dry as well. Just in this position, I, I'm I could probably find an even better place, but even here I could set a tarp up and I would be out of the rain. Um, and when you're doing uh, a fire, that's a benefit as well of having the tarp. 
So right sizing the fire, um, thinking about how much flame you're going to get, setting the tarp high enough. It doesn't need to be so low um, that you can only just sit underneath it. You can have it so that you can stand underneath it, have a reasonable fire. Um, the flames might be still up here, but it's going to be, you know, a meter and a half before you're before your tarp. Um, yes, there might be a, a bit of ember or a little bit of burning material that goes up and that is a risk and you will over time, if you're regularly having a, a, a fire underneath a particular tarp, you will over time get some little pinholes in it. I've got some big tarps that we use on expeditions and they are set at heights that you can stand underneath and we have pretty sizable fires underneath we're cooking etc 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 we're lighting fires and getting them going quickly in wet conditions in windy conditions they've only got a few tiny little pinholes smaller tarps that i use for personal use where i might stop and have a fire underneath um hardly any issues with them at all and even then if you get a tiny little pinhole prick in them uh, the surface tension of a globule of water is probably so, so that the, the water won't even come through that little hole um, you have to have really big fires under tarps to really damage them substantially um, and you might be worried about the heat um, if it's really wet you've got all that cooling on the outside i've seen tarp steaming like it's like water vapor coming off the outside of a tarp because of the heat on the inside but you feel the tarp and it's not that warm um certainly nowhere near the melting temperature of the tarp so i think making sure you're not making the fire too big to start off with particularly if um you're thinking what you'd need to do lighting it in the rain versus lighting it under cover thinking about not having it too big because a lot of that heat that you're losing is going to recirculate and then just not setting it too low in the first place just being sensible about that um, you shouldn't have any problems um, that's that's my advice and if you're really concerned about it you know have your tarp you know have it on a bit of a lean uh, maybe more of a lean to type setup and then just have your fire just in front of it and then you're getting the radiant heat that way you still you're not going to get the convection benefit but you've got some radiant heat you're in the dry the fire's just there you can do it that way as well if you're still concerned experiment with it at the end of the day you put a tiny little couple of pinprick holes in your tarp who cares you know it's going to last longer than you anyway Don't be too precious about your gear. Look after it, but don't be too precious. Don't let it stop you doing things. Question about more bushcraft on television. This question is from Kevin via email. And he says, hi, Paul. I finally got up the courage to ask a question. Have you any plans to extend your work into television? Or do you think the whole subject has been covered by the likes of Ray Mears and Bear Grylls? Personally, I would love to see something along the lines of Lisa Fenton's thesis, where she examines the history of bushcraft skills and the links with indigenous peoples. Thanks once again for your efforts. Best regards from the Czech Republic, Kevin. P.S. Have you ever travelled to Central Europe? Um, I have travelled to some places in Central Europe, Kevin. I have not actually ever been to the Czech Republic, though. Um, I've heard a lot of great things about it. It will, it is on my list, and it will, will be visited one day, um, but I haven't been yet. Um, more bushcraft on television. Have I got any intentions to move into television? Not massively. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit with uh, Joe Robinett uh, on a recent Paul Kirtley podcast. Um, again, links can be found under this video, whether you're watching on YouTube or watching on my blog at paulkirtley.co.uk. If you're listening via audio, wherever you're listening via audio, go to paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash askpaulkirtley. 65 ask paul kirtley 65 you'll find this episode on all the notes there links related articles and there's also one about fires under tarps i should link as well related to the previous question from mike i'll put that under here as well um the podcast with joe robinett i'll put under we talked a bit about tv there um he has a big audience on YouTube. I've got a very modest audience on YouTube. But last time I looked, it was about 28,000 on YouTube. Um, I'm hoping to grow that this year. Um, 
I've often used YouTube as just a reinforcement of other things that I'm doing. My my hub, my home, if you like, on the internet has always been paulkirtley.co.uk and that's where everything gets put. And then other things, uh, then some things are put on other platforms as well, like YouTube or SoundCloud or iTunes or what have you. But I do want to concentrate more on my on my YouTube channel. I think I'm going to concentrate more on that than looking at any uh, television opportunities because the benefit for somebody like me is that I can go direct to you. I can speak to you about the things that you want to hear about. I mean, this would never work. Aspel Kirtley would never work on television. It's too niche. It's too um, specialised an interest area. Um, it's not a format that the casual interest person would be particularly uh, engaged by. Um, it's not a five minute clip entertainment, fast moving, fast paced thing. It's for people who want more in depth information. And one of the benefits of having an ability to go direct to an audience is that you can go as in depth as you want. You can go narrow and deep. And I prefer that option, frankly, than uh, broad and shallow which a lot of television ends up being, unfortunately, because of the nature of the economics of television. Um, they need big audiences to justify the airtime, to justify uh, what they've charged an advertiser for advertising before, after, during the show, um, or to justify whatever other funding they've got, whether it's a, a, if it's a public broadcaster, if they've got a license fee or other public funds. They've got to justify, they've got to say, we put this thing out and we got this amount of audience. And um, <clears throat> that's hard for niche interests on television. Um, but there's a lot of interest in the survival end. I could see that there's more survival shows. I can see why the things like Alone and Naked and Afraid are popular. Um, they are slightly uh, exploitational in the sense that you're kind of viewers are getting some vicarious pleasure from watching somebody in a difficult or awkward or challenging situation but not being there themselves. Um, they're also relatively inexpensive to make. You know, I've got a broadcast quality video camera here that I'm talking to and you can send people off into the woods um, to do their survival challenge and film themselves with that type of kit and that can be put on television with some editing clearly and clearly you've got to pay for safe risk assessments and safety um, people being present and the logistics of getting people there and of course the equipment but compared to making a big documentary series or a lot of types of television um, it's relatively inexpensive so I, I can see why it's gone towards that end of the spectrum as TV budgets have got squeezed um, and then the question really is for you, the viewer, if you find that uh, educational or just purely entertainment. Um, would I be interested in getting involved in that as a participant? No, not especially. Um, would I be interested in presenting something on television? Maybe. But to me, television now is just another platform. Um, it, and, and there's so much... Um, there's so much convergence. You know, I can go onto my television now um, I've got an Apple TV box, I can watch um, YouTube, I can watch Netflix, I can watch Amazon Prime, I can watch Apple stuff through the Apple TV, um, I can watch Vimeo uh, videos on there, uh, it's all on my television. Um, and equally, I can link my laptop via Apple AirPlay to my Apple TV box and anything that I want to play, I can play on my, on my, um, on my laptop, I can stream to my television. So it's kind of like, I think we need to change our definition of what's television. You know, I would rather be making these and getting questions directly from you and not having a TV producer trying to tell me how to behave or how I should be doing things or an editor chopping up things to make me look a certain way. I'd rather have control of my content, to be honest with you. And I think that's one of the great things about the internet. It's a democratization. Um, I can go directly to an audience. Joe Robinette can go directly to an audience. Um, anybody who wants to make the effort and is good enough to uh, hold people's attention can get to an audience that is interested in what they've got to talk about. Um, that's fantastic and that's what television is having to compete with now and you know that if you look at the statistics of 
how much time people spend watching television it's much 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 less than it used to be for a whole host of reasons um, but social media um, platforms such as uh, YouTube are a big part of that we go and find the type of content we want to watch rather than sitting there waiting for it to come to us like we used to you know you remember you know you you'd get like a new ray mir series or or something come up out of the blue advertised on bbc2 or channel 4 and you'd be like great i'm going to watch that that hardly ever happens now where you're just sitting waiting for the content to come to you um you go and find the, the type of material, the, the answers to the questions that you want, you, the learning that you want, you can go and find it from people directly now. And I think that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And I'm very happy to be part of that. So if the right opportunity came along, maybe, but equally, I don't think any of us really need it anymore, frankly. That's the thing, um, particularly not in niche interests. Clearly, there's a space for things like large sporting events, you know, the Winter Olympics, um, football, uh, Super Bowl, um, all of those type of things. T TV owns that stuff and that makes complete sense. Little shows about bushcraft, you can do it on the internet. You can do it better than TV probably. Because the people are passionate and there's no TV producers, um, editors or anybody else that are just trying to earn a living getting in the way or getting, getting either trying to extract value, i.e. a salary from it, or trying to earn a, uh, earn a living raise their career or any of those types of things which you get um, attached to any larger project it's just like it's me and it's you I might sometimes work with a cameraman I might sometimes ask somebody to edit things for me but largely it's just me talking directly to an audience and I love that directness Getting pumped for arms when making feather sticks. This is from Chris via Instagram. Nice picture of a few feather sticks there. Nice curls. And his question is, knowledge is key, but the right kit helps. Yeah, it's a nice way of putting it. I found my forearms getting pumped when doing feather sticks or any heavy carving tasks. I've been conscious of over-gripping my Condor Bushlaw knife and don't find the same problem with a Mora Clipper or Companion. Is this likely down to the handle profile or technique? I climb and paddle, so I'm not unfamiliar to physical work. Any input greatly appreciated. It could be that the handle's too fat. That could be one thing. Just if you, if, if, if you look at that Bushlaw compared to your mora and think you know look at the two together if it's considerably fatter that could be it just how you're holding your hand where where your forearm muscles are sitting when you're gripping that could be part of it it could also be the angle of the blade relative to the handle that you're having to do a lot more stabilization than you might need to um, with your wrist i.e your forearm muscles that could be a reason why Without seeing your technique, I don't know which part of the blade you're using for the majority of making those curls. But one general point I would make is if you're using the part of the blade that's closest to the handle, there's least leverage on your wrist and therefore least strain on your forearm muscles. The further away you get from the handle, the closer you get towards the tip, the more leverage there is on your uh, on your wrist for, for pressure at that point in the blade and therefore the more uh, strength needs to come from your forearms to hold it in any given position. So it could be that you're working a long way away from the handle and that could be part of it. It could be just that the angle of the blade as you, you, you might be starting off nicely close to the handle and as you move down and slice across and you move towards the end of the blade. If the angle of the blade relative to the handle isn't great if it's just slightly too shallow you'll lose purchase towards the end and you'll end up having to turn the blade in which again can put a lot of strain on your forearm um, the moras are very good at making feather sticks yeah regardless of what other knife you've ever used it, I, I go back to a mora clipper and um, i prefer the mora robust just because it's not quite as fine a blade um, and i find that better the mora robust but that shape of blade um, 
notwithstanding the bevel profile, that shape of blade and the angle of the blade relative to the handle and the way that the blade runs off in a very gradual, even curve makes it very easy to control the curls and make good feather sticks. I think they're excellent for that job. And um, any knife that has a similar profile tends to do well in making feather sticks. So it could be a difference in those factors. Also, I'm just thinking about the Condor Bush Law. If I'm thinking about that knife correctly, I think that knife's, and I may be wrong here because I'm not a knife geek, and I, but I see a lot of knives. Clients bring their own knives to courses, students bring their own knives to courses and trips. I seem to recall that knife being quite hard to sharpen if I'm thinking of the right knife. Um, and the steel's quite hard. And it might therefore be that it's not that sh not as sharp as it could be, in which case clearly you're going to put more effort in to get the, the right angle and to get the right amount of bite with your blade, in which case it's going, to, it's going to pump your arms a bit more. So it could just be sharpness, but there are those other dimensional aspects that I talked about as well. And have a look at the comparison. Um, hold, the, hold the center line of the handles together and then see if there's a difference in the way that the blades then progress from the handle. You might find that one is a slightly different angle and it actually only takes a few degrees. When we were developing the PK1 knife, which sadly isn't available at the moment, um, people that have got one are lucky to have one. Um, it's, not a, it's not a finesse carving knife, but it is a solid wilderness knife. It's very good for battening. It's indestructible um, under any kind of normal use patterns, even heavy battening. Um, it makes very good feather sticks, but at first it didn't make very good feather sticks. And what we had to do was just adjust the angle of the center line of the blade relative to the center line of the handle, just down a couple of degrees. And it made all the difference in the world, particularly as, the, as you moved away from the handle, it kept the grip on the curl um, when you went towards the tip, which it wasn't doing before. Um, I can create some of the best curls with any knife with that particular knife because I spent a lot of time developing it to be able to do those day-to-day -day expedition tasks. It's a wilderness knife that's meant to be robust and you, thought needs to go into those things and it may be that just the angle is slightly wrong um, with, with that particular knife um, or it could be that it needs sharpening. I would look at those, those two things, those two things in particular, Chris. Hopefully that helps and if you want take a video of you making feather sticks if you want me to analyze it anymore stick it on instagram and tag me ask paul kirtley and i will have a look at it okay time to harvest wood for carving a video question via instagram that wasn't intentional so chris see what um craig's done here with his question you can do a similar thing just film yourself making feather sticks so i can see what's going on with the knife angle your hand your wrist etc etc okay um so this one is from craig taylor paul craig here hope you're keeping well paul my question for ask paul kirtley this time around centers around carving or more precisely the collection and processing of wood prior to carving here's a question is there a time of the year when it is better for me as a, as a novice carver, and I'm thinking about carving spoons here, nothing more intricate than that. Is there a time of the year when the collection of the wood is, is better for me and also better for the tree as well that I'm taking it from, bearing in mind that I'll be harvesting green wood. Is there a time when I'll be doing less damage to the tree and making my life a little easier as a newcomer to this carving world. Hopefully you'll be able to answer this question. Uh, and as always, a huge, huge thank you for everything that you do for the, for the bushcraft community. You add a real value to, uh, to it. So do please keep up the good work and hopefully speak to you soon. Cheers. Uh. So that's that's a nice question, Craig. You're clearly, you know, thinking about uh, you know damage to the environment, but also developing your your skills and not just hacking stuff whenever. Um, 
Yeah, you will water. Generally, you're going to be carving green wood for the type of projects you're talking about, spoon carving, etc. Particularly if you're sort of practicing for carving in the field and making things as you go. Um, wood will be often quite dry um, in the winter um, as the, for deciduous trees it's, it's shut down um, and then as the leaves start to come out the sap's obviously rising at that point the wood's going to be a lot wetter and you see that manifesting itself in, in several ways uh, that, are, that are commonly seen, even if you've not spent a lot of time looking at these things. So for, so for example, the sap rising in birch trees, people tapping birch sap, but you, you don't even necessarily need to tap a, a birch tree to see the birch sap rising. Even two branches rubbing together. I remember sitting on a sunny uh, late March day, uh, one year in, um, Sussex, bright blue sky, sunny, um, birds are singing and I was sat there and I was it felt like I was being rained on like there were drips of rain landing on me and I looked up and what was going on was there was a bit of a breeze and two uh, birch trees which were growing next to each other had overlapping branches they were rubbing against each other and where they they were rubbing there was clearly a, a wound there on one if not both of the trees and sap was dripping down from there just little drips and um, that was just down to the sap rising at that time of year that wound might have been there for months but once the sap starts rising it comes it comes and that so that that moisture is going up into the wood particularly in the outer parts of the wood but it is going to be wetter um, the other thing is that if you're going to be using willow bark for cordage, it can be almost impossible to get off the tree, uh, off the branch in the latter part of the year. Once you get past about August, it really starts to dry up and it can be really hard to get the, the bark off um, towards the end of the year. Whereas in the spring, it just peels off beautifully. It's really wet between the wood and the, and the in the bark and it just comes off in one big sheet. Uh, smells like sort of cucumber and uh, and it's just malleable and pliable and, and works and works great. So that's two kind of fairly commonly known differences. In terms of the wood itself, given where most of the wood, where, where most of the moisture is transported, it's not right in the core, it's, it's further out. It will make some difference to the moisture content of the wood but it won't make a huge difference. Um, so in terms of it drying out when you're carving it, it, it it's going to be roughly the same. You know, I wouldn't worry too much about that. What you probably want to worry more about is if you're taking bits off a tree and the sap is rising, is that going to leave a wound where it's going to lose a lot of moisture? So, you know, if you took a, um, if you took a limb off uh, a a, a large limb off uh, a tree when the sap was rising it could potentially lose quite a lot of moisture out of that I wouldn't necessarily be doing it right at that stage but once the leaves are out um, that that volume that velocity if you like is going to reduce buzzard buzzards just landed in the tree above me I've got I've got no way of showing you um, because I can't actually see him now. Um, he's up in the spruce tree, that, that one there. Just saw him flying over there. That was cool. Um, so yeah, I, I would avoid damaging trees at the height of the sap rising. Um, other than that, in terms of you carving, it's not gonna make a big difference. Um, and then the other thing I would say is if you do take a branch and you're going to be making a thing, try and use as much of that as you possibly can. I think that was a kestrel that just went through. It's like, I've just, I'm all of a sudden I'm in a bird of prey center. <laughs> Sorry to completely get distracted, but that was just popped down and flew along up into that bush there. It's that time of day where everything's starting to look for somewhere to roost. Nice end to the day, nice light now. Um, I think I've answered all the questions on, the, uh, given all the main points on that I can, Craig. Um, don't worry about it too much. Um, make sure you make a nice clean cut. Make sure that things are angled away from the center of any tree, particularly if it's sort of coppiced. 
Um, make sure that you don't just saw a branch because it will split and the split will run into the tree and then you, infection will get into the main trunk potentially. Make an undercut first and then further out, undercut about a third of the way in at least and then further out make another cut so that as it breaks away that split hits the undercut and it cuts it comes off cleanly without splitting all the way into the trunk um, and then just make sure that you use as much of, as possible of the materials that you collect either yourself or give them to people that you're with that can do something similar with it and make some nice stuff and post it on Instagram for us to see <laughs> Tifa fiber extraction. This is from Brian, Brian Leggett, who's a student on my tree and plant course and on my online elementary course and is a very conscientious chap um, and he always asks good questions. Um, I'm currently studying reed mace, Tifa latifolia. Amongst the many uses of this wonderful plant, I have found multiple references to extracting fibers from it for use in textiles and cordage. It does not seem to be well known for this use in the UK and I am wondering how the fibres are extracted. Keep up the good work. Many thanks, Brian. Well that is a good question and you are correct in that it's not so well known for that. So uses of Tifa for matting and cordage really come down to two parts of the plant. Um, the more commonly known um, part of the plant for that usage uh, for matting, uh, for, so that matting could be for flooring, it could be for covering ground ovens, it could be for making doors, um, it could, you can even make baskets. Um, that is the leaves and depending on what the use is, um, you might be using green leaves or you might be using dried leaves. Um, and that really just depends on whether or not shrinkage after the fact is a an issue. And also, you know, if you're putting something over a ground oven, you probably want green materials. Um, I've made matting with Tifa leaves for food preparation surfaces, for example. Um, you know, whether it's preparing uh, raw foods on them or if it's for serving uh, not the same surface of course, basic food hygiene, or if it's for serving you, you might have roasted something over the fire and then you want a serve surface to put it on to serve it so that you, you're not, it's not down in the dirt for example. You know, it could be a panast salmon for example, you want something to put it down on. It could be a roast um, chicken or a pheasant or something that you've done over the fire or a rabbit, you know, that you want to put it down. You might have done a honey glaze on it or something. You want to put it down so people can um, pick bits off it or slice bits off it. You want a surface and making a quick mat from green leaves is a good way to do that. So that's, that's you know, one way using the leaves. Um, in uh, parts of Canada, um, I learned that they would make a long needle. It's a bit like a sewing needle in proportions, but big of wood. And then they would put um, twine through a series of leaves using that needle, basically just feed the, the, uh, the leaves on um, and so that they're all threaded together. So you kind of have more of a sort of uh, a blind effect so that you could pop the thing together, but then lay it out with them all overlapping. And that could be used for doors. It could be used for a floor matting to keep all the pieces together. And it took much less weaving, interweaving of things, um, which can be quite fiddly for bigger mats. Um, so that's another way but then if you want to make cordage yes you can use the leaves but it never ends up being super strong what's much better is using the fibers from the rhizomes and you know what rhizomes are Brian but for those people that don't know what rhizomes are they're kind of a root but they're not really a root that the more strictly speaking they are an underground stem and with tifa with cattails um, what you have is that you have an established stem and then you have a rhizome that comes off which has little roots on it um, a rhizome that comes off and then at some point you will get a new shoot that starts to go up and the tip of that shoot was kind of what was sometimes called cossack asparagus and that's quite tasty in and of itself well, it's not tasty but it's crunchy it's got some texture to it um, you can eat it as a vegetable and um, boil it first though because it's normally in fairly stagnant water um, but that comes up to be a new shoot and the energy for that new shoot comes from this ropey rhizome which sits between the established stem 
and the new stem and that in the center of that is a, is a set of fibers, a bunch of fibers, which are surrounded by starch. And the starch is a really good source of carbohydrate. It's one of the best wild sources of carbohydrate that's easily um, found and processed. And, excuse me, we do that on our intermediate course, the uh, Frontier Bushcraft Intermediate course. That's something we have students do. But what you'll know from... Um, if you've ever eaten cattails that way where you're just roasting the rhizomes over the fire you're splitting them out and you're extracting the starch from the fibers as you end up with all these fibers that's where you get the fibers from for making your cordage that's the best way to extract them eat the starch the fibers you're left over with yes it's probably a little bit unsavory that you've got these slimy um, fibers but yeah wash them off a bit and you've got all the fibers then and they lay up really well into good quality cordage they're very strong australian aboriginals did that in particular i know for a fact um, they used a closely related species um, of tifa which looks to all intents and purposes just the same as the uh, cattail that you or i would know from the northern hemisphere um, and they used the roots for food and then they fibers that were left over were then used for cordage and so you're kind of getting two birds with one stone there you're getting your food and you're getting your fibers and then the laying up method is exactly the same sort of two ply lay that you might do with uh, the fibers from the inner bark of uh, willow or nettle fibers for example it's the same process uh, once you've got the fibers so hopefully that helps and a uh, good question i like the questions that get into the real uses and the in-depth knowledge of these trees and plants and animals that's what bushcraft is all about to me but i'm happy to answer other questions here as well this isn't all just about bushcraft wilderness bushcraft survival skills and outdoor life in general and as the first question said knowledge is key but kit helps and definitely I am happy to answer questions that help you improve your outdoor life that's what I am here for that is what I do for a living and I am happy to share what I know uh, via these shows um, without the need to go through a television uh, company <laughs> so thanks for watching if you're watching thanks for listening if you're listening please do subscribe on your favorite platform whether that's on YouTube whether that's on a podcast app because it helps me um, it doesn't just help me in some sort of ego way by me looking at my subscriber numbers a lot of these platforms now work on the basis that the more subscribers you have the more likely it is to show that show to show that episode to somebody else that likes similar things so please subscribe um you know and I'll, I'll i'll you know i'll let's game this like if you subscribe to a podcast but don't really don't really spend any time on youtube if you have a youtube um uh, account please just subscribe on youtube as well or vice versa because it helps the visibility of these shows on those platforms which helps me get these uh, get this quality information out to people um, who would benefit from it so you know i don't ever ask for you know people have said can can we donate can we pay money can we transfer some money for uh, you know via paypal uh, for these shows why don't you put a patreon thing you know frankly if i want people to pay for stuff i will ask people to pay for stuff i have paid online programs where we go into a ton of depth on a ton of things and if you're interested in those when i mention them sign up to get the information packages the pre-course information uh the uh you know the free videos or whatever it is that i'm showing you to give you a taste of what it is that i'm offering by all means do that but the rest of the stuff is free the one thing i would ask you to do to help me if you want to help is just try and share it as far and wide as possible try and subscribe on platforms because the algorithms work to show it to more people yeah if something is it looks uh you know if something is popular it will sit there at the top of a of a feed and more people will see it and then you get that virtuous circle that's the best way you can help me so if you could do that subscribe 
liking as well commenting is always good uh, let me know what you think of this episode if you've got any comments on any of the answers that are more uh, that can provide more insight information to the people who ask the questions of course i welcome that in the comments below the youtube video or below this on my blog at paulkirtley.co.uk forward slash ask paul kirtley 65 ask paul kirtley 65 and i look forward to answering a bunch more questions on episode 66 which will be with you before too long in the meantime enjoy the outdoors and stay safe cheers <laughs>